Hey everybody, today we have a, a special treat today. I have the man, the myth, and the legend, Ron Spomer here. You, I do notice a little extra gleam in your eye. The, the gleam says, I've been on an elk hunt. Hey, that's just the gleam of success. <laughs> we had a wonderful elk hunt up here in Idaho. I finally drew a tag for hunting in my own state. That's awesome. Very good. Well, Ron, I want to play a little game with you here that I didn't prep you for at all. Uh -oh. okay? Now, we all know there are certain cartridges that, you know, are so versatile, like a 30 out six that you could hunt just about anything with. But today's game is a little bit different. I'm going to, I want to go through pretty much all the major big game animals that people hunt. And I want you to tell me what the perfect cartridge would be. I mean, if you have 10,000 guns to choose from, what would be the ideal choice for each one of them? A couple of quick ones. How about pronghorn? 243, six Creedmoor, six five Creedmoor? No, no, not the not the six fives. I'm going with the 25s. 25 okay. out 25 out 25 out says very flat shooting, light recoil. I could go 257 Weatherby Magnum, but I got a soft spot for the good old 25 out six. It's just not a, enough people really appreciate what that thing can do. I think that's that's just such a cool little cartridge. I mean, it's been around since 1920s as a wildcat, and it hung in there and hung in there and hung in there. It wasn't until the, yeah, it was 1969 when Remington finally legitimized it, 25-06 Remington. And just, I don't think it gets enough love, but it is just perfect for the 25 caliber. A lot of people talking about a 25 Creedmoor maybe coming in a couple of years. I think that one will be interesting as well. See yeah, if we can know. revive yep. the 25 caliber. How about feral hogs? Feral hogs, oh boy, anything. Yeah, I had a great hunt with a 358 Winchester one time. Not a lot of people even know that thing. It's the 308 necked up to 35. Yeah, what do you want that for? Boy, you take that on a hog hunt, it puts a thump on those pigs. I, I like <laughs> the win. Yeah. And that's not a bad option for elk either. All right. How about a little faster animal about the same size? How about a coyote? Oh, I've been a 22-250 guy on coyote since the late 70s, early 80s. I got into, I, I used a 222, a 223. And when I got into that 22-250, done. We're there. That and is, is 22 the Creedmoor ever going to knock it off? Oh, yeah. Could very well do it. I went to the 22-250 Ackley Improved quite a few years ago. Had uh, Daryl Holland build me a custom rifle on it. Beautifully accurate rifle. And I've done most of my coyote hunting with that one. It adds about 100 feet per second. Uh, to the 22250, which isn't a huge deal, but it increases the life of the cases if you're hand loading. And I got it in a fast twist barrel so I can shoot it up to at least 75 grain bullets. I haven't tried any heavier than that. But if you've got a really windy day and want to reach out there, boy, that thing sure does a trick. And I have been knocking coyotes off with that for a long time. Good point. Now the big one, most popular by far, is deer. But again, deer, to me, the, the difference isn't so much, you know, the size of a deer that can be different. It's the terrain you're hunting deer in. You know, if you're hunting deer, you know, on the edge of a cornfield and, you know, you're going to take a 100, 150 yard shot max compared to where you are in Idaho, where you may be clear across canyon. So maybe let's take mule deer and we'll call it a more of the western open terrain and white tail deer more your ground blind stand kind of kind of hunt but what might you pick for each of those yeah if you're ground blind stuff back east most guys are shooting inside of 100 yards 30 30 32 special 35 remington any of the older things a lot of guys like the the liver actions and they are and fun. confess is it because of the sound ron is that why the 30 30 not just the sound, but the cool look of being John Wayne or something like that. Man, you can't beat it. And it feels so cool carrying him through the woods. That was the first rifle I hunted with. Model 94 30, 30 Got my first two deer with it. I felt like a cowboy. <laughs> it was fun. I, I can't argue against it. So many people will write me and say, I don't know why you're harping about all this ballistic coefficient and these high velocity things, man. I've never seen a deer more than 100 yards away. Well, great, man. You have chosen the right cartridge with the 3030 for that kind of hunting but if you ever got to a clearing where the biggest buck of your life was standing broadside 275 yards away you might wish you had a 308 instead of a 3030 now so 308 you, is that the pick for mule deer 
No, yeah, that's the internet's gonna fun. break here, Ron. If you recommend the 308, the internet's gonna no. break. <laughs> the earth shook on its foundations. No, I am not gonna pick. I would pick the 708 over the 308. But I'm going with the uh, for the mule deer. I'm going for the 280 Ackley Improved. Oh, very nice. Out, yeah, yeah, out in the open country, I could roll with the seven rem mag, but really is a little more than you would necessarily have to have along. And I like a nice lightweight rifle. If I'm doing a lot of hiking and covering ground out west and up and down the canyons and whatnot, if I can get a five pound rifle, get it scoped up and have it field ready at about six to six and a half, that to me is just a lot more fun to drag around for a week than rifle that weighs in at seven to eight pounds. And it's easy to do that with a 280 AI. So yeah, I'm gonna go with the 280 AI on the mule deer and on the white tails, even though I love that 3030 and enjoy that close woods hunting with it, most of the time I'm gonna go with something along the line of a 284 Winchester, or yeah, a lot of times I'll use a 25 on six, just because I don't necessarily need that extra reach, but I have been in those situations where I thought, oh, I'm gonna get my deer inside of 100, 150 yards, and it turns out that I've got an opportunity at three or 350. I can then make it. I better to err on the side of having too much than too little. And speaking of, it's better to have too much than too little. Today's video sponsors Lear Capital. It helps us to have plenty in our investments by investing in gold and silver. You can have physical gold and silver that's proven over thousands of years to be a good store of value. So a few things have happened recently. The S&P 500 has plunged since August. It's been painful if you've been looking at, at your retirement accounts. Plus, just the state of the economy, upcoming elections, and the insane inflation that we've seen, what can happen when our leaders print too much, there's real cause for concern about protecting what we have earned. Gold has proven to be a good store of value over thousands of years. Lear Capital has a 25-year track record and thousands of five-star reviews. They're a very reputable company, so you can go to learbackfire.com so that you can get an investor guide to get more information about it, or you can call into the number and get some information about perhaps taking the IRA you already have and using some of that to invest in physical gold and silver. That's LearBackfire.com. Check it out. All right, the big one is elk, right? That's the one that everybody always asks about because I think for most hunters, it's it's maybe going to require a different firearm than what they than what they have. You know, a lot of people have hunted deer. You got your 308, your 65 Creedmoor, and again, lots of people take elk with those too. But a lot of people, when they're looking at an elk hunt, they say, okay, maybe I want something a little bit different for this. So one cartridge forever hunting elk, what would it be? 338 Winchester Magnum. 338 Win Mag. Okay, tell me about that. Yeah. So a lot of front frontal diameter on that guy. Usually yeah. that's something that you, it, it seems to me, maybe when I, when I hear you talking about, you know, the value of the frontal diameter, it's not something that, that means as much to you as maybe some other people, how they value it. So why the 338? Yeah. Well, just because of that, I am aware of that bias on my part. You know, I, I like the sectional density of the 300 Magnums with a heavier bullet. It's better than the 338. You don't have a great sectional density with the 238 until you go 250 grain to 300 grain bullet. And a lot, not a lot of guys like to push that much bullet. But if you stay down at the 220, 225 grain, it's a pretty good option. And the recoil is a little closer to the similarities with the 300 Magnum. So I think most guys can learn to handle that. And then you do have that, what a lot of guys think is important, that little bit of extra bullet width there that might help out. So... I could just as easily roll with any of the 300 Magnums and or the eight millimeters, the 325 WSM. I've, I had a one shot kill on an elk with that one time. I've had one shot kills on elk with 140 grain bullets out of a 284 Winchester, 130 grain bullet out of a 270 Winchester. But then again, I've had some 300 wind mag shots, 180 grain bonded bullets, and it took three shots. He was essentially dead on the first shot, but you know, elk in the, in heavy cover you don't want to just shoot once and wait for him you want to get him down before he runs off and goes down into a hellhole somewhere or into some thick brush with blow downs you'll never get him out of shoot that elk until he goes down okay yeah for sure and so you, you recently just just barely went on an elk hunt what did you take on that was that the 338 win mag no took seven rem mag 
Seven, seven mag, okay. Mag, yeah, that is kind of my do it all. I, I think if you're going to strike a balance and use one rifle for pretty much everything, especially in North America, seven rem mag. It's not too much for the deer family. Um, even with the smaller bullets, you could do pronghorn without tearing your pieces. Uh, again, choose the right bullet. But if you need to step up to the bigger stuff, you can go up to 175, even 180 grain bullets. And you've got excellent sectional density, big, long bullet. And you go to some kind of a, a bonded bullet or a partition style, a frame sort of a bullet. Or my favorites are always the coppers. I've just had so much luck with them. And I've been using Barnes bullets since 1990. And I just started using hammer bullets a couple of years ago. And I find them to be incredibly deadly. And I can push them a little bit faster than most others. They've got this double radius groove system, and it really minimizes the contact area with the lands. And I think that reduces the pressures in the drag, and you're able to push that bullet a little bit faster. So when I follow the recipes in hand-loading manuals, and it says you ought to be getting about 3,000 feet per second, I routinely get 3,100 or even 3,150, and it shows no excessive pressure signs. So kind of a nice little bonus. Uh, next is my favorite species overall to hunt. Like if I just had one animal I could hunt over and over and over again, it'd be the odd ad, uh, Barbary sheep. I love those things. I, I mean, they are so much fun to hunt. Uh, I like the terrain they're in partly because it's warm where they are. <laughs> I, I, I live down in the desert uh, in St. George, Utah, kind of near Las Vegas. I like the heat. Um, and so I just love Audad. What, what would you be your, your pick for a cartridge? Well, you know, that is a surprisingly tough animal, Audad. It's, it's a sheep goat. It's not really a sheep. It's not really a goat. It's kind of something in between, but it's an interesting animal. I've hunted, I don't know, maybe shot six of them or so. I remember, I, I think I took my first one with a 270 WSM, if I remember right. And I uh, remember the fail safe bullet. Kind of, I don't know that. It was a copper bullet, copper nose on it that opened up like a barn, but in the shank, they had shoved lead and locked it into the back to increase the mass and the BC because of the additional weight. But the pedals would generally break off. So you'd get the pedals sort of breaking off and causing some peripheral damage. And then you'd have a solid shank driving forward. But it tended to on the smaller animals, in my experience, uh, and like this odd ad, it's sort of targeted target arrow performance seemed like it poked right through without enough expansion because I shot that animal perfectly and it stood there like it hadn't even been hit and I'm waiting for it to expire and it's not doing it and then it starts walking up the hill with the rest of the crowd so I knew something was not right if he's still walking so I took a high shoulder shot and broke his spine on the next one and then on that same hunt I shot um, a peccary javelina and same deal shot him behind his shoulder and zipped right through him. And he just took off. Like, is he ever going to fall? I had to shoot him again. Mm -hmm. So I think that was the bullet was too much bullet for the size of the animal, but it did suggest to me that these odd ad can be awfully tough. Now, the last one I shot, I used a 260 Remington, 120 grain TTSX and that zipped right through him, but opened up like those usually do. It did run about a hundred yards before it expired, but I'm not, not expecting that with those copper bullets quite often these animals will dash for 100 yards before they fall but i just see massive hemorrhaging inside i know i've destroyed the vital organs um, and then i don't have to worry about hitting that major muscle group or bone if i make a bad shot and hit that shoulder smack on that bullet's going to get through anyway so if i had to but, pin you down on a cartridge for that one yeah i i could go with any of the 6.5s or the 270s and just because of the classic tradition of the 270 Winchester, I might have to go with that. All right. How about a black bear? Black bear is one that I hear pretty wide ranging opinions on. And I think the reason there's such a wide range of opinions on what to use for black bear is you can shoot a 120 pound black bear and you can shoot a 320 pound black yeah. bear. And there's a pretty big difference uh, on, on how big these black bear are. Um, and so I hear some people say, oh, they're so easy to kill. They just knock right over. And others say, oh, they're like a tank. They're hard to knock over. What would you take on a black bear hunt? Yeah, you know, the black bear hunting I've done does not suggest to me that they're like a tank and hard to knock over. I've done them with 3030s and 270s and 30 at sixes and 284s. I think I've probably taken more with a 30 at six than anything else. And I think that's what I would come down to. I've shot across canyons in Idaho 
to take them on the far side. And I've taken them over bait stations in different states. Um, I like spot and stalk on them. We were doing some great hunting up in BC one time where they come out in the spring and feed on the clover on the edge of the old logging roads and stuff. And you can just wend your way along that road and get fairly close and shoot them that way. Where a 45, 70 would be really fun. Uh, but if you have to shoot across a clearing or down across a clearing, uh, that extra flat trajectory of the 30 out six with a 180 grain bullet, but I've even used 150s and done just fine with it. So I, just because the, th the 30 out six really doesn't get a ton of love for anything when you say that what's the absolute best for anything, nah, it's in the running for everything like the 308, but it's not perfect for any one thing. So just because of the good old grand old gal, I think I'm going to go with the 30 ot six for bear, even though the 3030 can do the same work, especially in close. I just want one more thing about the bear. The bigger entry hole and exit hole you can put in on the better because that long hair can soak up blood and then makes it a little more difficult to blood trail. You might not yeah. find blood for quite a while if they run. So it's always good to make a bigger hole in and out. Okay, now moving to the to the animal that has driven me crazy that I haven't shot one yet. Um, one day we were sitting in the living room and my wife said, you know, a caribou would look really nice above the fireplace. And <laughs> somebody's going to call the news like nobody's wife ever says that, right? <laughs> That's what you want, man. <laughs> <laughs> but I have not shot a caribou yet. So what would you recommend for me on a first caribou hunt? Well, I think of a caribou as sort of the in-between a mule deer and an elk. Uh, I think I've shot at least one bull that we estimated went 450 pounds. Pretty big, beefy thing. Uh, a couple of 140 grain swift A-frames out of a 7 millimeter 08 did him in. And one would have been plenty. But again, you're up there all that way and you shoot once and you don't want to take chances. You might as well shoot again. So I gave him two shots with that. But... I think I've taken most of my caribou with things in that 270, seven millimeter range, a few with the 300, but the 270 is more than plenty. Um, even with a 130 grain bullet, once again, it comes down to the bullet. They're not so big, tough and bulky as an elk that you're really going to be worried about the bullet not getting inside. Unless it's a, a cup core bullet and you have to take a funky angle, you just don't want to have to hit a major muscle mass or bone with those bullets and try to get inside. So stick with your monolithic bullets or bonded bullet at least, or a, a walled bullet like the partition or the A-frame. And I think you're going to do fine with something in the 270 class. And there are plenty of people who use a 243, but I don't think I would travel all that way, spend that money, and then have to take a long shot that was kind of getting on a ragged edge of performance from something that small. But I, I know the natives up there use it a lot because it's just so efficient. And a lot of them were even using the two two three. Yeah, the, those native Alaskans they uh, they they're a yeah. different breed up there. They're a different breed yeah. up there. Um, so if you pick a, a two seventy, why not the six eight Western? I, I if you're like me, I was all excited about six eight Western. I think it's a fantastic design. I have one. I really like it, but it mm -hmm. just has kind of fizzled in the industry. Do you think six point eight Western is gonna? continue to fizzle or do you think it might eventually catch fire yeah I, I hear you and it's kind of unfortunate that it's fizzling like that it's just the marketing campaign i don't know they're just not a people not enough companies got on board chambering it i don't know what hornady does with like this the seven prc and the six five uh both the creed and the prc but whenever they come out with something it's like they've already laid the groundwork and gotten a whole bunch of manufacturers to agree to chamber rifles for it, which makes it obviously a lot easier to sell it because folks say, well, I'd like that cartridge, but I don't like the rifles that it's offered in. Mm -hmm. And with the Winchester, you can get some great Browning Expo rifles. And it's always the classic Winchester Model 70, one of my favorites. But those aren't exactly the latest cutting edge designs in rifles that a lot of the younger folks like. So I think they just say, well, 6.8, well, it's close enough to the PRC, the 7 PRC and the 6.5 PRC. It's kind of in the middle. So I'll go with one or the other of those instead. But I agree with you, the ballistics of this thing and its size and everything else, it's just right there. I think it's the optimal 270. If you like a 270, you're right in the perfect position with that 6.8 Western. 
I took the longest shot of my life with it and scored perfectly right where the bullet was supposed to go was where it went at 777 yards and a lot of people have slapped me upside the head for taking a ridiculously long shot like that because I don't generally advocate extreme range shooting but I was working with the manufacturers to test this stuff out and I know they wanted me to take something other than crawling up and shooting at 50 yards and the conditions were perfect for this long range shot I'd been doing a lot of range shooting with it and had a loophole scope custom dial and it was working perfectly. If I dialed 550, it hit 550 every time. And uh, I just knew that it was going to step right out there and do its thing because that I'd done it on the range within the last two, three days on this hunt. So when the conditions were perfect, animal in the open, no escape cover within probably a half mile in every direction, uh, all by itself, calm, had no idea we were there. Wind has died down to absolutely nothing. We had two range finders to confirm the yardage. I had a solid rest against my back on both elbows, kind of in a corner post, and shooting sticks out front. And I did some dry firing with my crosshair on the shoulder. And every time it went click, that crosshair stayed right there on its shoulder. So I said, all right, <laughs> I think I can try this one. And that 175 grain Sierra bullet landed right on the shoulder where it was supposed to. And that was the 6.8 Western. Hey, how much do you hand load versus buying factory ammo? Oh, gosh, Jim, it's probably 50-50 because I think given my job, what I do, I need to stay up on what's out there. So I do shoot a lot of factory ammo to keep up on it and see how effective it is. But I love to hand load. There's just increased satisfaction, I think, with building your own and taking game with it. So I try to balance it out. So I did that elk with my hand loads. No, I didn't. I did I did use factory loads with that. That's right. All I had was the uh, 139 Barnes tipped triple shock. And a lot of people thought that was way too light of a bullet. But I said, well, listen, the bull went about 10 yards. Essentially, he turned around <laughs> and fell over. I shot him two times. And some guy said, well, then it wasn't a good enough bullet. You had to shoot him twice. No, I always shoot him while they're still up. He was essentially dead on his feet, but you just don't take chances with an elk. So gave him the second shot and both. Well, I found one bullet and one must have passed all the way out. And the other one was against the hide on the far side. Beautifully expanded. The pedals flared out like they do and massive hemorrhaging inside. And there, there's your dead elk, 413 yard shot. So the 139 grain bullet did just what it was supposed to do. Did just fine. And a lot of people do recommend that going to the lightest bullet available if you're going to a copper because it's probably going to penetrate all the way anyway. And so you might as well get some extra speed. Yeah, that's the way I do it. How about, say, now you mentioned 7 mag is kind of your, your do-all cartridge. Do you feel like 7 PRC is a significant, um, I don't know if I want to say improvement, but uh, eh, improvement, it, it's an improvement over time. We make little upgrades to all these cartridges. Yeah. Uh, do you feel like it's it, it's it's notable or is it just the cartridge of the minute? No, I think it is notable. Actually, I think it's going to become the new 7 rem mag. When the 7 rem mag came out, it set the standard and it was a world beater. And it's been that for a long time. I mean, a lot of 7s have come along to try to displace it, but it's just such a nice balance. You know, it's a magnum, but it's not a super magnum. It's not going to beat you up. If you can shoot a 30 out 6, you can shoot a 7 rem mag. And I think this the 7 PRC isn't but maybe 50 to 100 feet per second faster. I don't think that was their goal when they created it. It was to be the optimum of what we now know about ballistic science. How can we shoot a really long high BC bullet, which is essentially, some people get upset about BC all the time. It's all we ever talk about. So think of it as aerodynamic efficiency. It's not just to prevent deflection in the wind or to minimize deflection in the wind. It's not to flatten your trajectory a little bit. It's also to retain more energy downrange because you're not wasting that bullet's energy pushing air out of the way. And who doesn't want more energy? Everybody's always saying, oh, you need a bigger bullet because why? You've got more energy and that gives you more potential punch and more potential penetration. And then the final, I don't want to say nail in the coffin because it's just the opposite of a burial, but the, the final tweak that makes it special is the tolerances are minimized in your chambers so you should be building rifles and ammunition to what are essentially match grade precision whereas the rem mag older cartridges a little bit looser on the tolerances can't seat your bullets out quite as far and all the little things make it just a little more difficult to get 
superior accuracy with the long high BC bullets. I know you have special interest in this year, and that is the elephant. What would if you had one perfect cartridge on an elephant? What would it be? Well, you're asking an absolute amateur here because I've only gotten one elephant, but that's one more uh, than me. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I was really shocked how effective the 375 H and H was on my elephant. That's what I used. Um, it is not ideal, I will admit that, but boy, was it effective. And I did a heart shot too. I, I talked to the PHs and they all recommended that. I hunted with a couple of friends over the years who did not go for that. They went for the brain shot. It is such a small target. And as you read all the old elephant guys and they will say, it doesn't matter if you use a 375 or a 700 Nitro Express or a seven millimeter Mauser the way Bell did. If you don't literally hit the brain, you will not get that elephant. You might stun him. You might knock him out for upwards of even a half hour. If you read John Taylor, he had it all figured out with his Taylor knockout values. But he is always referring to what happens with a big bullet or a small bullet hitting an elephant near the brain, but not in the brain. So I went for the hard shot, but I was amazed at how effective that was. One shot with a 270 grain hammer hunter bullet, and that elephant was already tipping over. That's, that's incredible. Career. Yeah, but I wouldn't say the 375 is optimum. Going back to your original question, optimum bullet, obviously you want a little more horsepower in it just in case, you know, there's always that, what if it's not the perfect shot? Um, so in that case, if you can handle the recoil, I would go 458 lot. With a 500 grain bullet, you're going to have as much, uh, actually a little bit more energy on target than you would with a famous 470 Nitro Express. That sounds like a great setup. Great setup. How about Prairie Dogs? You know, I don't do much with Prairie Dogs anymore, but the last few years that I was hunting them, you know what my favorite was? A 17 HMR. Oh, okay. I need a 17 HMR in my life. I don't have one. Yeah, that and the uh, the Winchester short magnum or super magnum, the, w, the 17 WSM Winchester super magnum is really the ultimate uh, of a rimfire cartridge. But just, again, it's just not enough manufacturer's chamber for it. I have it in a uh, 85 Winchester Browning 1885 single shot falling block action with the external hammer and I absolutely love it. I can get that thing to shoot half inch groups, even sometimes a little tighter than that. And there's something about running that lever down and watching that big breech block slide down like silk and then putting a cartridge in one at a time and closing it like a bank vault and then targeting <laughs> that prairie dog. I mean, you know, with prairie dogs, there's so many of them. You don't have to be in a rush. And that gives the barrel a little bit of time to cool down. And I don't know, I just enjoy taking my time. And what I will do is I will stalk through a prairie dog town. If I can find one that's got a little bit of hill to it, so I can ease to the top of a ridge and just shoot over the top of the grass. A lot of the dogs don't, with that little report, they don't get all spooked. And I might get quite a few shots before they go down inside of 200 yards. And both the uh, HMR and the WSM-17 can easily reach that. And it's just so much fun. You feel like you're hunting rather than just sitting there shooting. Well, that's awesome. Well, Ron, I really appreciate um, you playing this little game with us, telling us about your favorite cartridges. Um, love watching everything you do on your channel, and it was great talking with you. Hey, I appreciate it. Love your channel too, Jim. Keep up the good work. Keep informing us and educating us. We love it.